Hey everybody, what's up? Gary Simon here. So today I was on the interwebs and I was uh, looking at a medium.com article and I scrolled down and it didn't let me read any of the article except for the first three lines, which fades into oblivion. Then it notifies me that I have to sign up in order to access the content. So that is so frustrating to me. I've seen other sites do it and it really just gave me the idea for today's video, which is 12 pet peeves in terms of UX that I have. And if you can avoid these things, you're gonna be pretty solid for the most part on your design in terms of the UX and not annoying visitors so much. So as always, make sure to subscribe and let's check this list out. Now, before we begin, this video is sponsored by Scrimba. Now, Scrimba is the easiest and most interactive way to grow your coding skills. It's a mind-blowing technology that allows you to play around the code directly inside Screencast. For instance, React is one of the most in-demand front-end frameworks for developers. This particular bootcamp will teach you all that you need to know about React using Scrimba's unique, interactive learning platform. So if you hurry up and click the link below here in the YouTube description, you will receive a massive discount, but you have to hurry because we're limiting it to the very first 50 people. All right, so these are in no particular order. The very first one I'm going to mention uh, is what actually spurred the idea for this list of things that I consider to be bad UX. And I was on medium.com. I'm sure many of you who've been on medium.com seen this, and it's the basically you're, you've clicked maybe from a result somewhere else, um, maybe on Google, and you, you want to read this article, and then it just shows a few lines of text here, and then it fades off into oblivion, and then lets you know that you need a free account to read this article. Very, very frustrating to me. Uh, it's one of the, the biggest annoyances. It's not just medium.com that does it. I think New York Times might do it, or Washington Post, or whatever. Um, and it, to, I understand the need, you know, there's different ways to monetize a site. Obviously, they want to build an email list. That's perfectly fine. But I have to say, if you can avoid doing this as much as possible, because I'm going to tell you, um, most people, maybe 99% of people, perhaps somewhere around there are going to click out. Um, and so just avoid this if you can. Try to think of other ways to possibly monetize your site. Next up, now this is an obvious one, splash screens. Splash screens used to be huge in the late 90s, early 2000s. I still see them though sometimes. Um, you know, Beginners essentially will, will do this. I, maybe they'll have some type of animation and then you have to click it to enter. That's very frustrating. It's fine to have maybe if you have like a real cool designer, sort of unique portfolio to have a little quick intro animation, especially if there's a, a lot that needs loaded in the background, that's fine. But I would automatically make it shift into the main UI rather than having a person to take extra action just to get to the UI. So don't do this for sure. Now the next one up is not giving a contact form. I see this all the time on portfolio reviews. Um, it's contact section. They give them an email address um, and maybe their Twitter or their Facebook or whatever, but there's no form. So some people might be visiting on their phone and if you only give them an email, their email client might not be set up. They're gonna forget about you. So that's a lost lead. Always integrate an actual form with a name and a message area and a submit button to send you that email and that contact automatically. Of course. Parallax. All right, so what I'm gonna call this one is excessive parallax. And this wasn't really excessive parallax in terms of this little example here, but it seems like when aspiring designers first discover parallax, they get really excited and they start to parallax everything. And that's just, it becomes very, very annoying. So there's good parallax and it's bad parallax. And I suggest each one of you uh, really do your research into uh, parallax and what, what constitutes good parallax and bad parallax. Bad parallax is gonna be overusing and creating way too extreme elements in terms of uh, your scroll-based positioning of elements. Next up is going to be order forms that make you sign up to purchase something. Now, of course, if you have a SaaS, which is software as a service, you know, like maybe a hosting business or you're selling courses or whatever, you have to have uh, an email account uh, in, along with a password in order for them to access their digital goods. That's completely fine. But I've seen many tangible based e-commerce sites requiring an account to order that there's no reason you should allow them just to sign to order something as a guest and make that an option all right so it should be optional there should never be a requirement if you're selling something like a tangible physical good or service that that, that gets shipped to their house um, so definitely 
they, that that will ultimately that will lead to less orders because some people just won't finish the process or sometimes people won't receive the email for the confirmation in order for you to get to that part so always avoid that next up is going to be custom scroll bars that suck <laughs> so of course this is like just like parallax there's good parallax and bad parallax but with scroll bars if you want to create a custom scroll bar please don't do something like this where it's this tiny little slither that's going to be hard for some people to access so always avoid doing this sort of thing i uh, and i see it a lot unfortunately um so you know if you're going to use them make sure they're easy to use beef them beefing them up if that's an actual word all right so next up is going to be long forms all right so i did a um a recent probably about a month ago a uh, video tutorial about form design and what constitutes good effective form design definitely check that out if you're unsure but this is an example of a really bad form design because you have a first name last name email address mother's name country state city address if you have to have all of these form elements break them up into multi-step processes so you're only showing perhaps the first name last name and email on one form and then a next or a continue and then have some sort of like a breadcrumb navigation knowing letting people know how many different sections of this form there are and then maybe your mother's name and then maybe the location or something like that that way you're breaking them up now if for some reason these all have to be on the same exact page then definitely separate them I uh, with white space or a divider of some sort so they're separated out and they're not all clumped together in this manner next on is going to be low contrast so I see this all the time as well and there's nothing worse than having a bunch of text like in the context of an article uh, where you have really low contrast it's hard for people to read it's bad eye strain it's just horrible so you want to make sure that you use a tool that checks your contrast so in the browser there's uh, contrast checkers um, within the um, the developer tools uh, for Firefox I believe and also for design apps like Adobe XD sketch and Figma there's also I uh, different color contrast checkers such as stark contrast that's the one I did a, a video review on recently but what's it, what it does basically is it takes a look at the text the color the, the color of the text as well as the background color that it's sitting on top of and you want to get to for small text at least a 4.5 to 1 ratio all right so that's a contrast ratio and that's basically the number uh, that's determined by the WCAG, which is the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.0, uh, which states that if you can get to at least 4.5 to 1 color contrast ratio, then you should be good enough for most people to be able to read this text because not everybody has the greatest eyesight. Next up, excessive ads. This is kind of a no brainer. We saw this sort of thing a lot more prevalent, you know, way back when, but we have an ad here, you know, we got an ad over here. We have an ad right there. We got an ad there. You got all these ads over the place and it just ruins the experience. Now I understand the need to monetize a site because some people, you know, they don't do things just for pleasure. You have to be able to make a living, but at the same time, if you do something like this, you're going to probably make less money because more people are just going to bounce, which means leave the site. So your bounce ratio is going to be crappy uh, because where am I supposed to look? It also creates a bad visual hierarchy too. So, cause you're really not sure where you're supposed to look first. So avoid excessive ads at all costs. Next up, lack of call to action. So right now, this is based, this is a quick uh, landing page design I did for one of the other tutorials recently last week. Um, and I took out the call to action. So just underneath here, it gives you somewhere to click, right? There should always be a goal or objective when you're trying to, uh, you know, create like a landing page like this. So in this context, there's, there's nowhere to click outside of just the navigation. And I see this on people's portfolios too. When I do my portfolio reviews, they'll say their name, you know, their role, such as UI UX designer, and then nothing else. You know, so you, if you want people to scroll down, at least have an animated scroll ind indicator icon. I uh, ideally, I would also put in a call to action button of some sort. You know, like I, uh, what, what's the main thing you want them to do, or what are they going to likely want to do the most? Like if it's your portfolio, it's probably like check my workout or see my portfolio. So something like that. Next up after that is cap captures on unimportant forms. Now I understand like if you're 
if you have like a, a user sign up form and you're, you start to get a lot of fake accounts, you need some way to make sure that people aren't robots. But for a contact form, I would never add one of these annoying recaptchas because they can be kind of hard to solve at times. It has those little tiles, uh, squares where you have to choose what's in the pictures and stuff. And it, it it's just really bad UX. Uh, and so on a form, I'm willing to accept a certain amount of spam because ultimately in there, you will find the real emails and the messages that you want. And the, because the most important thing was when you want somebody to contact you for whatever reason, you want to make it as easy as possible. You don't want to have to to, to solve equations just to, to, to get in a hold a touch with you. So for some for whatever reason, a person might not be able to solve one of these, and you just lost thousands of dollars, perhaps if you know, depending on what the contact the purpose is. And then finally, last but not least, is unresponsive design. Now, of course, this is probably out of all these twelve examples, we see this the least because you know, fortunately. People have wised up, you know, in terms of, you know, the fact that we have smartphones and we have tablets, you know, we, we now know to use media queries to make our designs responsive, but there are still companies, even large ones like this one, Kiesel Guitars. I'm a guitarist. This is a great guitar company, but their website just absolutely is horrendous. It sucks. Very old design, outdated, but worst off is there's it's not responsive so it looks like a very miniaturized version scaled down version of their desktop version and it makes it hard to use and to click around on the navigation uh normally you'd have like a like on a smartphone like this you would have a hamburger icon menu but no it's all listed out in these tiny little icons on your phone and you have your pudgy fingers and you're trying to click them and it, it just doesn't work it's the most frustrating thing ever and so most people most people say at this point in time they are responsive but even then, I would say not everybody gets all the responsive elements right. They don't really uh, adjust correctly the, the various elements like a gallery or whatever. Sometimes they're too big. Sometimes they're still too small. So what I would say the takeaway, if you are a modern, modern UI designer and you do know what responsive design is, make sure that you're really paying careful and close attention to exactly how you're manipulating the layout. Always try to put yourself in, in the user's shoes use your app on a small crappy phone and make sure it's very usable and it makes sense. All right, so hopefully you enjoyed that. What are some other things that I probably inevitably left out? You know, one thing I think I definitely left out is the whole GDPR cookie acceptance models. I understand that it's required for a lot of people, but a lot of people kind of make those custom designs very annoying. Maybe they'll, they'll take up too much space or whatever. Um, that's definitely one I left out I should have included. What are some other ones? Let me know in the comment. Give me a subscribe, and I'll see you soon. Goodbye.